Okay, now I get to grill you. Uh, thanks, guys. You've been great. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, if you have questions, hold them up. We will get to as many of them as possible, but I get to go first. My prerogative. Um, well, first of all, seriously, thank you for everything you're doing to help mitigate the problems in Houston. Um, there's no silver lining to something like that, but I was struck by how well the communications networks held up. It's unbelievable. The stories are remarkable. I, mean, I, can, I can remember looking at my Twitter feed, seeing people saying, I'm, here's the address, I'm stuck on the roof, come rescue me. You know, and I mean, so long as their batteries held out, the network held out, right? which is really remarkable. That's one of the hardening things uh, I think that I draw from my past couple of days here in Texas is that the communications networks of all kinds really were lifelines to people in moments of need. And mm -hmm. so I had a chance to see when I was visiting the George R. Brown Convention Center that uh, Crown Castle and Smart City were working together uh, to make sure that the 1,800 people who are currently there have access to Wi-Fi and to other high-speed wow. networks for free so that they can be able to fill out FEMA applications, connect on Facebook with their loved ones and the like. Right. I mean, that's literally the only link they've got to the outside world. Um, Duracell came with a mobile power truck to help them uh, power up their devices because, as you know, once the battery goes out, right. that device is essentially a brick. Right. Broadcasters stepped into the breach. Uh, radio stations stayed on the air 24-7 without commercials. TV stations likewise. I visited KPRC in Houston. And it was just incredible to be in the conference room. And they mentioned very casually, yes, you know, on those benches in the, on the side of the room, uh, we had people sleeping overnight because you know, they, either they didn't have any place to go or there was no place they wanted to be more than here in the station covering news that was wow. important. And to me, at least, I think the communications industry deserves a significant uh, clap for the fact that they really did uh, make sure that people were connected. And I think you know, this part of the public safety uh, emergency response system is something we all have a lot to be proud of. We can improve it, obviously, and uh, following this in Irma, we're going to make sure that we do that. But yep. I think we should look at also you know, what went right and not just what went wrong. All right, wrong. well, let's give them that clap because we appreciate that. How many of these questions do you think are about net neutrality? Oh, I'm not familiar with that term. Is that, uh, is that it's... Um, <laughs> It's uh, net neutrality is winning actually here. <laughs> well, so okay, we know we have to talk about net neutrality. Sure. So um, we don't have time here to do a primer on net neutrality, but there's obviously a lot of concern uh, by witness of what 21 million comments or something, whatever like 22 it was. 22 million yes. comments yeah. on a regulatory proceeding. Um, not everyone has the same confidence that I, as a free market person, have. I don't believe companies profit by screwing over their customers. I, th I think companies profit by making the customers happy. Not everyone shares my view of that. And so there, there's a strong opinion out there that government is needed to protect consumers from right. gatekeepers or whatever you want to call it. And so that's why in the waning days of the Obama administration, we had a set of Title II reclassification that went through that was far and above net neutrality, as you know. And then we had the privacy regulations that also came through. Uh, some of your first moves have been to, let me see if I get this right, prevent the privacy regulations from coming into effect, right? And then also to look at reversing the title to reclassification, okay? Right. Um, what role is there for government let, let's assume that Title II reclassification is reversed and we go back to the same policy of the last two decades on the internet. What then is the role? Does the FCC have a role in setting out some principles? Does the FCC say this is Congress's job? I mean, one of our, one of our principles at IPI is that policy should be set through legislation, not through regulation. So is it Congress's job to address this? Will you seek to, to put forward some principles? What happens after Title II is reversed? That's a decision that Congress has to make. Uh, Congress, of course, always has the prerogative ever since Article I of the Constitution was a, a ratified to set what the rules of the road are going to be. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. the framers didn't have in mind independent agencies uh, uh, like right. the FCC, but nonetheless, Congress is ultimately the one that sets the policy for uh, the United States. And uh, so I would have to defer uh, on to whether or, uh, and to what extent uh, they want uh, the FCC involved in this space. But mm -hmm. a part of the reason why uh, we are engaged in the current uh, proceeding at the FCC is to figure out uh, what, what should the rules of the road be? Uh, we all begin, I think, with a fundamental truth, which is that all of us favor a free and open internet. 
I personally believe that the free and open internet that we've had since the dawn of the commercial internet starting in the 1990s has delivered value that is incalculable, certainly inconceivable to those uh, who were around back then. I mean, I still remember you know, the 64K modems and the AOL CD-ROMs in the mail, and to think that we would go from where we were in the 1990s when I was in school to holding a device that is not just for making phone calls, I and mean, that's the last thing people use phones for now, it seems like, you know, sending emails, watching videos, sending tweets, ordering chicken sandwiches on your Chick-fil-A right. app. I mean, right. this entire thing is a, is a really powerful device, and it was all created as a result of free market innovation, of uh, regulatory rules that were light touch, set during the Clinton administration, that incentivize the uh, investment of trillions of dollars into the networks and the creation of these uh, companies. I mean, 20 years ago, nobody knew what, uh, very few people knew what right. Google was or, or Amazon and the like, and those have grown into very uh, powerful companies. And I think it's sort uh, of that internet economy that's become the envy of the world. And uh, as former Chairman Kennard, who was chairman uh, under President Clinton, has often said that uh, th that type of free market light touch uh, approach was, uh, was the right one for his time. And so what we're trying to figure out now is, uh, what should we return to that framework or what should the rules be? Right, and right. so we'll sort through the facts in the record and uh, make the appropriate judgment. One thing, again, from a policy standpoint, policies that are put in place through legislation tend to be more stable than policies that are put in place through regulation, right? I right. mean, I cannot imagine being executive with a large corporation trying to make long-term decisions knowing that any election could completely reverse the regulatory policy. You know, right. how do you make a long-term decision there? So, right. I mean, so I mean, I appreciate your deferring to Congress and saying that's Congress's job. Yeah. On the other hand, Congress doesn't seem to be getting much done these days. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it does seem that when Congress doesn't act, there's this huge vacuum that's created, and there is a tendency of you know, a powerful executive or of a regulator to step in and say, well, somebody has to address this, so we're going to. Right. No, and, uh, you know, as uh, someone once told me, hell hath no re fury like a regulator board. Uh, so, borrowing from <laughs> right, Shakespeare. Right, 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 right. Uh, so, I, uh, obviously, uh, we are a creature of Congress. We don't have mm -hmm. independent legal authority that uh, you know, lets us do whatever we want. Uh, we ultimately are bound to administer the Communications Act and the Administrative Procedure Act and other uh, uh, legislation that Congress has adopted to guide our thinking on these issues. Mm -hmm. And so, I've always taken the position, not on just on this uh, question, but on so many different questions, that you know, the first thing we have to do, boring and as arcane as it seems, is to figure out what the parameters are for uh, discretion for the agency that Congress has set for us and uh, you make the appropriate judgment based on the facts that we find in the record. And uh, that, I think, is that's the very definition of limited government because I think once yep. agencies become untethered from the statutory restrictions that our elected officials have placed, I mean, you essentially have another branch of government uh, right. free-floating that's uh, making up as they go along. Exactly. And, and, and so that's why we need legislation to actually take away that discretion from regulators to do that. Um, so long as they don't abolish the FCC before my term is up. Of course not. Of course not. That's all I ask. You, you, you yeah, want so. the FCC to have broad, expansive powers while you're there, and then afterward, then get, get shrunk down, right? Yeah, right. We, we can talk. We can talk. Yeah, we'll figure it out. So. This is the net neutrality stack, by the way. Oh, um, our, and, and, and what's the, this one base? Yeah, no, who's the intrepid person who yeah, asks? Is no, this AM radio, that. or we're what's the question we're about? We're going to get here, to that. So, no, all um, right. The, the net neutrality questions all fall into two categories. They're okay. either related to free speech or they're related to blocking. Okay. Okay. So I'm pro free, free speech. And, and, just free, you know, and, and freedom of speech actually was one of the ones I wanted to drill today. down on too. Sure. Because why don't we do that? Because we have this interesting situation because the whole idea of freedom of speech is based on the public square, right? And the public square is owned by government. That's right. why it's a public square, right? Right. And I think most people understand that, that First Amendment rights do not apply to private platforms they apply to public platforms, right? right. We have a recent uh, court decision where one of the justices said social media is the new public square. And I think that's, that's an accurate observation. Social media has become the new public square. But social media is private. It's not public. Yeah. It's not like going down to the park and standing up on a soapbox, right? And so the standard free market answer to this is, Okay, so your account got canceled by Twitter, your content got taken down by Facebook, whatever. Sorry, private, First Amendment doesn't apply. Sorry about that. That's sort of the standard free market answer. It's a very unsatisfying answer to a lot of people. Right. And it does strike me that we are in a new place now where, where the public square is not public. The public square is private. Now, most center-right sort of free market conservative groups like IPI have been against net neutrality. We've been against all that kind of stuff. If one of the, today, if one of the net neutrality principles was no viewpoint discrimination, right. 
I think a lot of people would pile on to that because there is viewpoint discrimination going on on these private platforms. And I think people are becoming very, very concerned about this. And, and our standard answer, sorry, you have no First Amendment rights on private platforms, that's a very unsatisfactory answer. Right. What, are, what do we do about this? I mean, do we, I mean, what is the competitive alternative to Facebook? Right. Google tried and they failed. Right. You know, what's the competitive alternative to Twitter? What's the alternative competitor to Instagram? Is, you know, is there, can the market solve this problem or do we, are we in a different place? I do think that uh, government has a limited role here. I believe very strongly in the First Amendment and the protections that it uh, provides. Uh, but as you pointed out, uh, those restrictions only apply as a limitation on government's power uh, to affect private right. platforms. And so as unsatisfying as the answer is, I would say uh, that under the law as I, I read it, uh, the government has no role to dictate uh, how platforms should operate uh, and what viewpoints so they should be able to tolerate or not. Now that said, what I've also uh, urged is that we embrace not just the cold parchment of the First Amendment, as important as it is, but also the culture of free speech. I think one of the things that makes America so unique is that we do have this tolerance for views that are different from our own. And if you look around the world and across history, that's exceptionally unusual. I mean, the human nature is obviously to not want to be around dissenting viewpoints. It's uh, the most natural instinct to want to collaborate and to work with and to live with and to be around people who think exactly as you do. And social media exacerbates that in a, in a way, because you can unsubscribe yeah. to opinions you don't like. Right, right? Or to, exactly. Right. And uh, on the other hand, you also do, well, at least I hear from people who vigorously disagree with me. Uh, but, <laughs> Doesn't uh, insulate you. Including Bette Midler, so, which is, uh, that was an interesting one, yes. I wanted to respond back, you are the yeah. wind beneath my wings, but I just, uh, uh, so, uh, but one of the things I've urged that, <laughs> one of the things I've urged uh, any party that operates a platform to do is to embrace the culture of free speech. And what I mean by that is that, you know, look, we all benefit from this marketplace of ideas. I and mean, if you go back to 1644 when Milton wrote the Areopagitica, I mean, the, the very notion that he had to get license from Parliament to be able to publish something was antithetical to them. And he talked about, you know, look, we, the, the, we, everyone should be free to publish whatever they want and to speak however they want. And that is the way, ultimately, that we get a more democratic society, more uh, classically liberal society. And so I certainly don't want anybody's views to be censored, unless obviously they permit a, you know, or present a national security or law enforcement risk or you know, threaten somebody explicitly. But uh, my, my, my fear is that uh, in many parts of American discourse, there's simply a view that, you know what, some views we just don't want to hear, and we want those views censored. And I fear that that is going to lead us down a very dangerous road, that pluralism might end up becoming something that uh, is uh, more for the history books uh, than for the current day newspapers and the like. And so yeah. um, I don't th think, as I said, just I just want to stress that I don't think government has a role in sort of dictating how things work mm -hmm. out, but I do hope that that culture of free speech is something that we continue. And as President Reagan once said, it's, a, it's for every generation to renew right. uh, that commitment to freedom. And, right. uh, I, I, I fear that some folks uh, might not want to com uh, commit. I, I think that if someone is arguing that, that the government should get involved in this sort of no viewpoint discrimination stuff, it, it, it harkens me back to the old fairness doctrine, you know, right. that, that, that was sort of the same thing in the broadcast right. world. If you're going to express an opinion, you have to make space available for another opinion. Right. And Reagan's doing away with that is essentially what caused sort of the blossoming of, you know, media competition and ideas and things like that, talk radio and things like that. Exactly, and that's one of the great things about the internet is it's given this unprecedented platform for anyone to be able to post something or to speak. And mm -hmm. so if you have your very strongly held views about the Black Lives Matter movement, you can post that on the internet. If you have very strongly held views about the free market, you can do that. And that's, I think, one of the great things about our, uh, our society and about the digital economy is that it's given voice to so many people who, in the analog era, would have had no outlet for that kind of right. viewpoint other than the literal physical uh, area that they inhabited. And so uh, I would hope that that promise of the internet, rather than its peril, would be something that uh, both regulators and, uh, and uh, private citizens would look to. So, so in your view, we're still in the early days and there's still opportunity for this culture to continue to develop in a beneficial way. 
I certainly hope so. I yeah. mean, I tend to be a happy, optimistic person, and uh, so I think that uh, I think Americans of goodwill believe in this principle, and uh, as has mis been misascribed to Voltaire that you know I may not agree with your view, but I'll fight to Depend the death, the for, death your, right. uh, for your right to say. I mean, I think that most people do still believe that, and it's important though for those people to speak up so that uh, when there is an impulse to instant to censor among a certain folks, that people speak up and uh, yeah. say no, we're not going to do that, and. Uh, in the, they have. in the early days of net neutrality, mm -hmm. there was concern about content blocking. You know, like an ISP would use their power over the consumer. To, you know, one day you'd wake up and you no longer had access to Apple iTunes because they were coming out with their own music service. And they were going to block you from that, you know. Right. I, I think the way the market's developed is obvious. No one would ever do that because they would never get away with that, right? Right. Um, but they would not get away with it because their customers themselves would not tolerate it, right? Um, so I, I go here because there's several little questions here that are still related to blocking, right? Um, in an imaginary scenario where an ISP actually engaged in blocking, which, which from a market standpoint to me is not going to happen, but let's say that it happens, do, do you need FCC net neutrality regulations to deal with this, or, or is the Justice Department not big enough to handle something like that? And that's, where the, that's precisely the question that we've teed up in our notice mm -hmm. of proposed rulemaking right. here. And so we've said, look, the internet economy that we had prior to 2015 uh, did not evidence uh, market failure along the lines of right. you know, widespread blocking and the like. And so uh, given the fact that we didn't see it before, do we need uh, FCC-led regulation to protect it in the future? Obviously, no one favors the blocking of lawful content. The only question is what regulatory framework is best calibrated to uh, secure the value of a free and open internet, including uh, the absence of blocking. And so uh, we're, that's part of the uh, discussion that we're engaged in. But mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we certainly uh, want to view it through a fact-based lens as opposed to uh, the lens of hypotheticals and, and sure. like. This question says, talk about net neutrality. It's just very, <laughs> very simple. <laughs> Um, net neutrality. Yes, okay, exactly. Done. I've answered your question. We've been talking about net neutrality for 12 years. <laughs> um, it seems like most of the regulations that were put in place by the previous FCC focused at the ISP level. Right. At, at, at ISPs are the actual internet providers, your phone companies, your cable companies, your wireless companies. And the companies we refer to as edge companies basically got off, <laughs> you know, scot-free, you know. Right. Um, but it's weird because it's the edge companies that get all my private information. You right. know what I mean? I mean, the people who, who have information about me are Facebook and Twitter and eBay and Amazon. And those are the people who, you know, who have my photos and my Netflix, my movie watching preferences, you know. But, but there are no regulations for the folks at the edge. It seems to me that the edge is actually where the customer is interacting the most rather than at the network level. So sh can we safely say that whatever government does, it ought to apply to the whole internet economy and right. not, not make these divisions between ISPs and edge providers and all that kind of thing? I do think that there are two basic principles that should apply uh, regardless of the issue. I mean, net neutrality is the most mm -hmm. obvious example here, but one is that regulation should be consistent, that you shouldn't have rules depending, that vary depending on the particular circumstances, and number two, that they should be uh, light touch and uniformly applied. And so I, I do think that that is the, the, the mode of regulation that we had starting mm -hmm. at the dawn of the commercial internet in the 1990s. And so that is one of the questions that we're trying to figure out is, is it better to have two sets of regulations, one for the networks and and one for the applications that ride over those networks, mm -hmm. to have multiple agencies involved, or is it better to have a single light touch approach that applies uh, consistently, that people can sure. you know, you predict and uh, uh, can make investment decisions on the basis of? People are also very concerned about privacy, mm -hmm. for understandable reasons. Um, you, you prevented new privacy regulations from coming into effect. This was sort of a storm in social media that, that you were right. somehow giving permission to companies now to take all this information. Right. I think there was an enorm enormous misunderstanding that people didn't understand that those were proposed regulations that actually never in, went into effect. Never got right? into effect. But right. again, people have a legitimate concern about privacy. Absolutely. Does the FCC have a role in privacy, or is this another thing that Congress should be addressing if it's being addressed at all? A great question. So prior to 2015, the Federal Trade Commission applied a uniform set of privacy regulations to everybody in the internet economy, to ISPs, to edge providers, everybody. Uh, the FCC changed that in 2015 with its Title II regulations. And that's because by deeming every single internet service provider from you know, Comcast down to Main Street Broadband, which has literally four customers in uh, Cannon Falls, Minnesota, uh, as a 
common carrier, it divested the FTC of jurisdiction because the FTC has what's called a common carrier exemption. They can't regulate common carriers. Uh, so then the FCC stepped in the breach and issued disparate regulations on ISPs that differed from the FTC's regulations. And so here, uh, the simple point we've made is look, when I go on uh, my iPhone and I pull up an app, I have a uniform expectation of privacy. I do not care whether it is an ISP or an edge provider. I want my sensitive personal information to be protected right. uniformly. And it seems to me that the appropriate response from the governmental level is to say, well, let's have a uniform system of regulations then to reflect that expectation. That is a simple proposition that I think people have talked about in Washington and often gets lost. And you know, just if you look at the black letter law under section 222, uh, for all you lawyers out there, uh, uh, the Communications Act, it explicitly prohibits the kind of thing, you know, uh, br selling browsing history. And that, right. that doesn't happen, and it's illegal for it to happen. So I'd much rather focus on the real expectations that consumers have as opposed to uh, you know, some of the fear mongering sure. that we've seen. OK, all right. We've talked about net neutrality. OK? I believe so. so, yeah. so <laughs> for maybe not to everyone's satisfaction, but we've talked about <laughs> it. So I want to talk to you about a couple of other things. What's up with you and radio? <laughs> one of the, I, when you first came on the commission, yeah. one of the very first thing you talked about was radio. Yeah. Now, I've been hearing for 20 years that radio is a dead and dying thing, you know, I mean, but you're interested in radio. I do. I, I, I personally like radio. Okay. As, uh, as Jenny knows, our hometown radio station, KLKC, was uh, our outlet to the outside world. And I remember in 30 years ago, 1987, Parsons High School made the state basketball championship. My mom wouldn't let me go. Not that I'm bitter. Uh, but, uh, but you, so but you but you still remember. Oh, I still remember. I remind her all the time. So uh, my only recourse was to take our transistor radio into my bedroom and listen to KLKC's broadcast of the game. And to me, it's amazing how many people you talk to, uh, it's sometimes over the age of 40, but you know, often younger people, too, have that mm -hmm. personal connection to a radio station. And uh, when I got on the commission in 2012, uh, I noticed that it had been literally a generation since 1992 that uh, anyone at the FCC had even talked about uh, radio reform and uh, to see what uh, the FCC could do to uh, help this grand old medium uh, continue. I mean, radio is the oldest communications service that we've got still. It's older than the FCC itself. And so I proposed revitalizing AM radio. I proposed a variety of ways to help FM radio stations as well. And the response has been tremendous. I mean, I know that it's not as a whiz bang as some of the technologies that we hold in our pockets. But nonetheless, 93% of Americans above the age of 18 tune in to a ra radio station regularly each and every week, especially during emergencies. So I just heard from some radio broadcasters yesterday in Austin. Radio listening was up 180 six percent on the next radio app just uh, during the last week alone and I think some of those folks are doing a tremendous job and some of the great visits I have and I still remember them fondly is you know, visiting places like WRDN in Durand, Wisconsin and KZPA in Fort Yukon, Alaska and uh, you know, KKOW in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Some of these radio broadcasters who are doing something that literally no one else in these communities will do. They will cover the high school football game on Friday. They will cover the Sunday sermon for folks who can't get there. Mm -hmm. And so to me at least, I know it uh, makes me look like a fogey to some, but <laughs> it's, it's, a, you know, it's, part of, it's an important part of the communication landscape. Okay, but, but there are things in the radio marketplace that the FCC can, can help? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so, okay. No, with, without question, uh, we've done a lot already. So helping AM radio stations, uh, uh, for example, get access to what's called an FM translator so they can uh, essentially broadcast on an FM frequency as a bridge to the future, help them boost ad revenues and listenership. Uh, that's been a big thing that we've okay. been able to do. And so okay. um, yeah, for those of you who prize your radio stations, uh, there's, there's more to come. So radio uses spectrum. This is going to be my segue. Yeah. Radio uses spectrum. Uh, we have some TV broadcasters here in the room. Yeah. Uh, we've just taken spectrum away from a bunch of, well, we didn't take it away from them. We allowed them to auction their spectrum off. Uh, but uh, the last question I have time to ask you is, are we going to run out of spectrum? Because all these wonderful devices, there, there's two things that turn them into bricks. One yeah. is lack of power. The other is lack of spectrum. Right. Right. So we have a, you know, it's like Say's law, right? Supply creates its own demand. We right. have an unlimited appetite for spectrum. Every time some spectrum comes online, we find cool things to do with it. Right. How are we going to continue to feed our appetite for spectrum? I think spectrum very much reflects uh, the sentiment that Kevin Coster exhibited in Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. Right, if you make right. more spectrum available, uh, all these innovative app developers will figure out innovative ways to, to take advantage of it. And that's a great thing. Uh, but from a regulatory perspective, that means that we need to be ahead of the curve. We need to be thinking very proactively about uh, spectrum and how ways to uh, incentivize more of that type right. of innovation. Um, I do think that uh, we are taking pretty active steps to make sure that uh, we don't run into uh, that kind 
kind of a roadblock. And obviously the incentive auction, which you mentioned, is mm -hmm. uh, uh, something that was started under my predecessor and finished up uh, earlier this year. Uh, it involves tele the television broadcasters voluntarily relinquishing some of their spectrum in exchange for a share of the proceeds. And that spectrum goes to some of the wireless companies. Uh, we've also talked, though, about spectrum higher in the band. You know, I remember back in the late 1990s when we had these big brick phones and the like that it was thought that spectrum below one gigahertz was, uh, or, oh, sorry, above one gigahertz was unusable. Was it useful, right, right? And now, I mean, with our spectrum frontiers proceeding, we're thinking about spectrum above 24 gigahertz. Uh, yeah, I visited with Facebook uh, last year and I was amazed that they're testing virtual reality applications that could allow, that use 60 to 70 gigahertz spectrum uh, to provide a really incredible high resolution uh, experience. And so mm -hmm. you can play a game if you're even with somebody, even if you're in a different room. I mean, that kind of thing is just amazing. But part of the reason why high band spectrum is appealing is that you have super wide channels that allow for high throughput of data. And also that you don't have a ton, I mean, some of these bands you do, but in a lot of these bands, you don't have a lot of incumbents, especially federal agency incumbents right. uh, sitting there. And so we're trying to think holistically about everything from you know, low band to high band uh, to make sure that we stay ahead of the game, and but, especially but when it comes to Wi-Fi. Tell uh, our audience who the biggest hoarder and least efficient user of Spectrum is. Uh, boy, there's, I think that might be what's called a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you mentioned government agencies. So uh, w the federal agencies hold uh, what is estimated to be about 60% of the spectrum that is usable for uh, wireless services as we know it. And so uh, oftentimes federal agencies don't have an incentive to right. use that spectrum in the most efficient right. way. And we don't attach a cost to it, so there's no a cost to them for essentially using the spectrum. And so one of the things that I try to work with my counterparts at uh, the Commerce Department and with other federal agencies like DOD with is I try to see if there's a way for a win-win here. You know, what if uh, you know, they relinquished some of the spectrum or shared it and uh, we were able to do that in a way that didn't impinge on some of the important uh, uh, functions that they use it for. Right. Uh, for example, the Department of Defense, if they're only using a certain kind of spectrum for radar in one part of the country at one time of the day, well, what about the rest of the country during other times of the right. day? Could we right. use that for the commercial side? Right. And so I think there are synergies there that we can recognize, but it's very difficult because, as I said, there's not always an incentive on right. the federal agency side to yeah. do that. Governments don't usually respond to market incentives, do they? Exactly right. And so one of my colleagues has proposed uh, essentially uh, requiring agencies to budget uh, for how much that spectrum is worth and to essentially provide Congress and the public an opportunity cost for okay. uh, the spectrum that okay. they occupy. And so that's one of the ideas that uh, we'll, we'll be okay. thinking about. We're going to have a lot of unhappy people because we didn't get to all the questions, but a lot of these folks have important places to be this afternoon, too. Well, more important so, than listening to a two-bit bureaucrat drone <laughs> on about so, radio? Come on. Well, please join, people, me, yeah, please join me in thanking Chairman Pai for being here with us today. Right. Thank you. That was great. Thanks so much. I wish we had more time. But yeah. Well, you're, you're not finished. You're not finished because uh, in seven to eight minutes, you need to do a private session with our Sumner Scholar. So if you're going to charge the stage and, and greet Chairman Pai, just say hello. Don't tie him up because he has one more thing he's got to do before he can, before he can head back to Washington. And ideally, a five-finger salute as opposed to the one-finger salute. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 but, uh, th th thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. Uh, take, take the brochures. Uh, make use of the BREs. Oh, I, sh I should also mention our next event is going to be October 20th, which is only six weeks from now. It's on the topic of campus free speech and the ramifications of that issue for society at large. And our guest is going to be Charles Murray, oh. the renowned social scientist uh, who was chased off the campus of Middlebury College for simply trying to speak, speaking of free speech. So we hope as many of you as possible will be able to join us on October 20th. Thank you and have a good rest of your day. Thanks.